Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on exactly where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, How to Build a Successful Insider Threat Team, brought to you by Dark Reading and Red Owl, and being broadcast today by UBM. I'm Lenny Liebman. I'll be your moderator today. And I'm just going to make a few logistical announcements before we get started. Um, first of all, I want to let you know that the slides will advance for you automatically on the console. You can also download a copy of the slides by clicking on that green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. I want to strongly encourage you to participate in the Q&A that we have um, on this platform. And you can do that by asking questions at any time at all during the webinar. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session to do so. As a matter of fact, if either of our awesome speakers shares anything you want them to elaborate on, you want to challenge, uh, this is a great opportunity to get uh, basically some free consulting. So just type your question into the Q&A window to the right of the presentation window, and then make sure you click the Submit button so your question actually gets into our queue. Um, also, at the end of the webinar, we're going to ask you to complete a feedback form. Please do so. Your feedback provides us with valuable information on how we can improve uh, future events. Also, if you want to launch the survey at any time in advance, just click that red uh, survey button. By the way, at this time, please enable, um, take care of your uh, pop-up locker. Get rid of it. Enable pop-up so that you can use all the interactive features of the webcast. Finally, if you're experiencing any technical problems, just type your question into that Q&A text area, and we will offer you some one-on-one -on -one assistance. So now on uh, to today's uh, presentation. Again, how to build a successful insider threat team. Uh, as I said, got two tremendous speakers today. Um, first up is going to be Joseph Blankenship, who's uh, the senior analyst at uh, Forrester serving security and risk professionals. Um, basically, uh, he helps clients develop security strategies and make informed decisions to protect against risk. So he covers everything from security infrastructure and operations and SIM and security analytics and, um, and security monitoring, threat detection, all that stuff. Uh, he's got a great pedigree that includes uh, McAfee and IBM and um, NTT. So um, he's going to be first up. And then we also have, um, after Joseph, we're going to have uh, Lauren Dana Rosenblatt, who is global head of insider threat at uh, the Blackstone Group, um, who you may be familiar with. Pretty awesome organization with, I think, uh, over $30, $31 billion worth of assets. I'm sure you're familiar with them. And also, she was previously at uh, Goldman Sachs, where she launched a firm-wide insider threat program uh, she's been involved with uh, DOD. She's got her MBA from Wharton, where I believe she also has taught on disaster preparedness. Um, and she's got all, all those initials after her name, OK? She's a certified information system security professional and certified ethical hacker and uh, just tremendous credentials. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from both of our experts today. And I think that's it for my preambling, Joseph. So I'm going to invite you to get started. Excellent. Thank you, Lenny. As Lenny said, I'm Joseph Plankin, Senior Analyst with Forrester Research. Uh, recently came out with a report called Hunting Insider Threats that talks about the need for process and for proper staffing around insider threats, uh, which are just as important, if not more important, than the, uh, the actual technology employed. So here's a quick agenda of what we're going to discuss before we hand it over to Lauren. Uh, kind of understanding uh, insider threats, what they are, who they are, uh, detecting them, you know, how, how do we go about detecting malicious insiders or accidental insiders, and then establishing the program. What are the, some of the considerations you need to make, uh, especially around staffing and process? So as I was writing the report, uh, Hunting Insider Threats, I talked to you know, quite a few uh, people like our, uh, our expert, uh, Lauren, uh, that run insider threat programs. Uh, this is one great quote that came back from a security leader at a Fortune 500 company. If any company thinks they don't have an insider threat problem, they aren't looking. And that is so very true. Uh, and when we say in, insider threat problem, it may or may not be a malicious insider. It could be someone just doing something that they don't know any better or they're violating policy. Because remember, any time that data leaves the premise or leaves the protected, uh, all of your security protections, all your security controls, yeah, that could be considered a breach. Uh, you know, leaving a uh, hard drive in, in a car or on the train, leaving a USB stick with data uh, in an unprotected area, uh, in, a, in a Starbucks, what have you, having a laptop that's not unencrypted stolen, uh, those types of things can all be insider problems of one kind or another. 
So we'll jump in to kind of understand insider threats and what uh, what do we mean here. We have a saying here at Forrester that all data theft is an inside job. And you may be thinking to yourself, wow, uh, what about people coming from the, from the external side, you know, cyber criminals and, and hackers and so forth? Well, certainly, they, they typically will – come in and masquerade as an insider, right? They will take, they will use compromised credentials or t compromise our equipment in order to gain access to the sensitive data that they're trying to get access to. And then we've got a couple of different types of insiders. Uh, those who accidentally disclose data, as we discussed, they don't really mean to, to break policy, don't really mean to go outside the controls, either do it maybe to you know, do their job quicker uh, get, get, kind of get things done and they're violating policy or perhaps they leave something behind, something of that nature. And then there are those who maliciously steal data. These are people do, that actually are trying to do something malicious uh, to uh, take data, exfiltrate it either for you know, profit or personal gain or, or something. We'll kind of dive into that just a little bit. Most of this, my presentation, though, will really focus on uh, the malicious insider. And here's the, uh, the reason why. Internal incidents are the most common uh, f reasons for, uh, for data theft. Uh, this is some, some of our findings from our 2015 uh, Global Security Survey at Forrester. So you can see this question here, what was the most common way in which a data breach occurred in the last 12 months? 39% of our respondents said an internal incident within our organization. If we break that down, 56% of, of those said it was inadvertent, it was an accident, but 26 percent said it was actual abuse, either abusing uh, privileges or malicious intent, where they were trying to do something malicious to exfiltrate data. So this is a real problem. This is something that uh, obviously, uh, when you've got someone like Lauren heading up a global insider threat program, as well as uh, all the folks that we interviewed for the hunting insider threat report, this is a real problem that people are focused on, and they're focusing. Uh, not only their security program on, but they're investing in people, in process, and technologies to go and detect these, uh, these incidents. And the reason for that is employees have a, a great deal of access to sensitive data, whether they need it or not, and that's a completely different question, right? And one of the controls we can put around malicious insiders is, let's evaluate people's access to data. How do we you know, limit their access to things maybe that they don't need to have access to. And, and you can see on the screen there some of the data types that people have access to. Uh, and this is, again, coming back from uh, the Forrester survey results. You know, things like customer data, uh, contract financial information, account numbers, you know, intellectual property, that the, the very lifeblood that makes our, our businesses go. A lot of things that you need to consider as a security leader, do, does this – individual user need to have access to this data to get their job done, or is there a way we can control that access or limit that access? And at the very least, we need to monitor that access to understand how they're interacting with that data and if they're able to exfiltrate it. And one of those things we've got to realize about insiders is they're very difficult to, to detect. Let's just say somebody breaks into my house and they come in and they're wearing a ski mask and they use a crowbar, I call the police and say, hey, look, my door is damaged, right? There's very visible damage that somebody came in and stole something. However, if they've got a set of keys in my house, chances are the police are going to look at me and say, hey, we see no signs of forced entry. We can't really help you, Mr. Blankenship. Uh, we're going to be on our way. Very similar with insiders, right? They're using, <clears throat> they're using their day-to-day -day access in order to – exfiltrate data or get access to things that perhaps they don't need access to. So you really have to focus on insider threat in most cases to detect uh, the malicious activity before it's too late, before the data is gone and the damage has been done. Malicious insiders look like everybody in your company. I kind of mixed this up a little bit. I found a guy with a ski mask and a keyboard as opposed to the guy in the hoodie and the key keyboard. But either way, chances are the malicious insider is not going to wear a ski mask to work. They're not going to wear their dark hoodie to work and sit in the dark. They're probably going to look like just like you or just like all your other users. So it's very difficult to figure out who amongst your entire team. And remember, these are your teammates. These are the people you want to work with and you want to trust and you want to be able to think good thoughts of. However, they can cause a lot of damage you know, to, your, uh, to your organization 
if they're able to you know, breach your data and, and exfiltrate it to somewhere it doesn't belong. The three main impacts for malicious insiders uh, include fraud, and that's typically trying to leverage insider access in order to, for financial gain. Uh, intellectual property theft, this is a very, very common uh, where it's more about uh, sometimes corporate or even state-sponsored espionage where a in insider is taking data to a new job, perhaps. It could be intellectual property. It could be sales contacts. It could be financial data that they want to take to their, to their next opportunity. It could be that they've been approached by a foreign agent uh, for profit and are handing over that intellectual property, especially in the case of uh, DOD or uh, national security types of organizations. Uh, then you've also got sabotage and destruction. These are people who are just interested in destroying things on their way out, typically someone who is angry. Uh, and, and on their way out of the organization, they want to be able to get some sort of revenge, either on a boss, a coworker, or the company itself by destroying it. It could also be uh, some sort of ideological idea that uh, where they've been uh, motivated to cause, to cause harm, especially in the case of uh, critical infrastructure, manufacturing facilities, uh, those types of things. So we've established that we've got an insider threat problem. So what do we do about detecting them? How do we find these folks? Well, fortunately, even though they may look like us and act like us, you know, they di typically do have uh, different tells that we can use to figure out uh, if someone is motivated to be a malicious insider. Uh, some of the common uh, motivations and uh, along with their intentions include you know, things like financial distress. If you know you've got a, uh, an employee who is under you know, uh, substantial financial burden and may be motivated to do illegal things uh, to uh, rescue themselves from that uh, financial distress. Someone who's uh, vocally disgruntled and unhappy uh, they want to you know, get back at the employer over you know, some sort of perceived wrong. An employee with a sense of entitlement. A few of the examples that, are, that we found in the, in the uh, insider threat research we did were that some, people, some employees were just taking data home just because they thought they could. They thought that was okay. Uh, but as soon as it gets out of the, uh, the control of the organization, especially anything sensitive, now it's a data breach. Now it's got to be deal dealt with appropriately, right? So that sense of entitlement that, hey, I work here, I'm entitled to this data. That does not really exist. It's your data as the employer, not the employee's data. Uh, another common one is announcement or fear of a layoff. So let's say we know that we've got impending poor financial results or we've announced you know, the end of life for a division, a subsidiary, the entire company we're going to liquidate. Uh, this is a time to watch, inside, watch people with access to sensitive data to see if they're going to try to leverage that access in order to protect themselves or give themselves a leg up going to their next opportunity or potentially sell that for profit. Uh, as we've already covered, you know, the revenge aspect, you feel mistreated, you feel like your boss, the company has uh, done you wrong, you may take, a, uh, take it out on the, uh, the company or its infrastructure or fellow employees. Then, of course, work conflicts, disagreements with other employees you know, may lead to some sort of malicious behavior, trying to harm the employee or uh, to harm the organization as a whole. Uh, ideology, you know, use it because you're motivated to either uh, take intellectual property and give it to somebody uh, that you feel needs it, or you, again, getting into the aspect of sabotage, it's an ideological you know, switch, whether that's been someone who has been uh, you know, approached by outsiders and then convinced to do this or they take it upon themselves. And of course outside influence more around espionage or perhaps somebody offering, approaching an insider and saying, hey, I'll make you a, a, an offer either to get your user credentials, uh, to get access to data, or to have you give me the data and those types of things. So one of the things that I think of what I think of how do we look for behaviors is casinos. If you've ever been in a casino and you look up at the ceiling, you'll notice that they have a very detailed, a sophisticated network of security cameras. If you haven't ever noticed that in the casino, uh, I suggest you look up because they're watching your every move uh, while you're at the table. They're looking to see if you are doing anything that may be against the rules to give you an, an advantage. Very similar to what we need to do to look for malicious insiders, right? 
They're looking for the behaviors that are indicative of some sort of malicious, in, intentional behavior. And you, typically in that casino, you can see the entire floor, but it's really focused on the table and the dealer, right? If you'll ever notice, the dealer usually has to clap their hands over the table, show their hands are empty before they reach for a new deck of cards, reach for chips under the table, or do anything away from the table, uh, just to show, hey, we're, I'm not doing anything wrong. So just as you know, we use those cameras to look for player behavior and we look for dealer behavior that could be a sign that something's amiss, Technology also has to be able to look for abnormal or suspicious, suspicious insider behavior. And thankfully, just like players at a, uh, at a casino table, there are tells uh, for malicious insiders. So sample indicators that someone may be um, a potential insider. It's not saying that somebody you know, that says, I'm getting a new job is you know, absolutely malicious. However, it may be a leading indicator. It helps give you a short list of leads of people to look at. Let's just say you're in a 20,000-person organization. Uh, can your insider threat program and your team focus on 20,000 people simultaneously? That is probably not something that's possible. However, if you're able to use leading sample indicators to, find, to, to create a short list of people to monitor, especially as they've announced that they're going, going to depart the organization, They've shown some things like uh, poor performance appraisals, uh, vocalized financial distress. Uh, they've had unexplained financial gain. You know, so if you, anybody remembers the movie Superman 3, when Richard Pryor drives up in a Ferrari after he uh, steals a bunch of money from the bank, that kind of thing, right? They look out the window and are like, who stole our $10 million? They look out the window, there's Richard Pryor in a Ferrari. Well, that guy must have done something amiss, right? So it's those kinds of things that can let us know, hey, we may need to watch this person more closely to figure out what they're doing. One of the tools we can use to do that, obviously, is user behavior analytics. It's a, it's a, uh, a tool set that allows us to look at user behavior and device behavior on the network to see how that user normally interacts with data and, and systems and to see if there's any uh, changes from a baseline. Uh, is a user trying to access a system they no, normally don't access or their cohort group, their peers, don't typically access to do their jobs. As that pattern suddenly changed, is there a change in geo uh, location that does not make sense with that person and their job? Are they suddenly, do we suddenly see a user account being accessed from overseas uh, when that user obviously is sitting right here in, uh, in North America and shouldn't be uh, showing up overseas? So it's one of the things that user, user behavior analytics uh, technology helps us to do is to focus on those behaviors to see how a user normally behaves, and then ha are they deviating from the norm? Are they accessing data? Have they pulled down data or done something different with data than what they typically do? Especially if we're looking at that short list, it helps us establish this is not just suspicious. This actually may be malicious, and now we need to do further investigation. So let's talk a little bit about establishing an insider threat program. What are some of the things we need to think about as we're doing this? Now, first of all, we don't want to come off with our fellow employees, our peers, our coworkers, the people we care about. We don't want to come off as, uh, as big brother, right? So one of the things you've got to focus on is um, employee privacy, especially in certain geographic geographies where it's very important that you protect employee privacy and their right to um, yeah, and their right to privacy, especially uh, if you're operating at all in uh, in Europe. Uh, many of the folks that I uh, interviewed for the Hunting Insider Threat Report you know, expressed uh, their frustration that it was very difficult to get an insider threat program going uh, in certain European countries, uh, especially Germany. So be very thoughtful about how do you go about this in certain geographies. Uh, focus on protecting your toxic data. Uh, as well. And when I say toxic data, what that means is we define that as Forrester as uh, sensitive data that we uh, call the three P's, and that's uh, PCI or cardholder data, PII, personally ident identifiable information, PHI, healthcare information, uh, plus IP, uh, intellectual property, and all of those together equal toxic data. And we call it toxic data because this is the data that will make your company sick if it gets out in the, in the public, if it's breached. Uh, these are the things that we have to respond to. We have to you know, send notes to our customers. Uh, we actually have to do an instant response plan, all of those types of things. So think about 
what is the data that we've got that is very sensitive people would want to have access to, and then build your controls around that toxic data. Uh, make sure as you're building the, your, uh, your insider threat program that you're very cognizant of the impact you're going to have on other organizations. And we actually recommend that you build a, a steering committee made up of folks like human resources, legal, uh, your risk officer, your IT department, et cetera, that help, that all have a stake in the game when it comes to insider threat. Uh, and make sure there's a plan in place. How, what, how, what do we do if we suspect someone of insider activity and build a process around that? Build policies, and it can be your current policies, but you need to build training around those policies to make sure that, in, that your employees know, hey, we do have an insider threat program. That means we're going to be watching for behaviors, and that's for your own protection. Uh, install a program of you know, the sort of see something, say something kind of angle, right? If you see an employee or you know of somebody who is making threats against the company, make sure you raise that so that it gets to the insider threat program and we can watch it. Because the worst thing that can happen is you, know, you establish a program, people realize they're being watched, they don't understand it, and they react poorly. If they understand it and they become part of the program, now you've got you know, a thousand eyes and ears out actually helping the program and, uh, and hopefully uh, embracing it as they know that it's actually there to help them and to help, uh, help their peers and to help their employer. And lastly, uh, monitor your employee behavior. Now, install uh, processes and install technology that helps you to monitor what their employees are doing, especially as you're developing that, uh, that short list. And we developed these 10 steps to an insider threat program. We're going to go through all of these in detail. But you know, starting at the top, uh, gain executive sponsorship. This is an insider threat is a top-down sort of initiative. Remember, your executives are insiders too, as are consultants, as are uh, third-party business partners that have access to your corp to your corporate network. Identify the stakeholders that will be affected, as we talked about HR, risk, uh, etc. Classify your data in terms of what is what needs protecting. How, how do we understand the controls around that toxic data? Look at your group, group your users. So as you're using your user behavior analytics tool to monitor those users, you've got peer groups established that you can understand whether or not they're coming out, they're doing things that are abnormal compared to others. Uh, again, define policy, educate your, your employees on the policy, and then enforce that policy. Um, Create rules of engagement that let your insider threat team know that this is how you're going to act when you see potentially malicious behavior. Make this a dedicated function, whether it's inside your security team or outside your security team. You can definitely ad advocate for it, not necessarily rolling up to your information security team. But the dedicated focus is let's make sure we, these individuals are trained and they know they're dealing with employee-sensitive information, private information that they've got to protect. Uh, inside the organization. Establish consistent processes and continue, make sure that whatever you're doing, you're doing consistently by the documented process. Treat every investigation that you do as if this will end up in a court of law because there's a pretty good chance that it will. You may not want to prosecute someone for stealing data. You may want to keep it under the rug. But let's just think if you make a, uh, an accusation against somebody that turns out to be false, they actually may take you to court as opposed to you taking them to court. Uh, lastly, train and communicate. I think we went into, you know, kind of drilled that in a couple of times. Then the last thing, and notice this is the last thing on the list, implement monitoring technology. Before you, in, you start with technology, think about the process, the policy, and how you're going to implement these things. All of those things are just as important, if not more important, than the actual technology that you use to monitor. So staffing your insider threat team, uh, perhaps look outside the security team. Look for someone who's got a, a background in law enforcement or counterintelligence, at least someone who's got investigative skills. Uh, invest in training that person and making sure that they understand, and this could be a single person, maybe someone who does this part-time to start uh, from your security team or from another team uh, before you end up building a team up around them. Okay. Start small. And then, uh, and, and then expand as, as need be, right? Invest in training these folks to make sure they understand the, the, the significance of what they're doing uh, and they understand the need for secrecy and privacy for all their coworkers. 
We can't go around treating everybody as if they're a suspect in, a, uh, in an investigation. I can't emphasize this enough. Build consistent processes and stick to them. Uh, when you find that short list, you've identified somebody who you think is malicious, have a consistent process on how you decide whether or not to investigate this. Who helps make that decision? It shouldn't be the analyst alone. It should probably be in conjunction with someone like an HR or legal or risk representative. Uh, and then follow that same process every time uh, with a closed feedback loop. Um, and then use your technology, use your UBA, use your DLP technologies to enable the process. And that will help you not only find the insider threat, but also protect, protect yourself as the organization, as well as your insider threat team uh, for, and your employees uh, from you know, uh, harming someone by uh, identifying them falsely or accusing them falsely. And with that, I'm going to wrap up, hand it back over to uh, Lenny, who I believe is going to uh, provide us with a uh, poll question. Yeah, and thank you so much, Joseph, for that uh, great overview of the various dimensions of uh, insider threat. So that was real useful. And again, if any of our attendees have any questions at all about what Joseph just presented, please feel free to use the um, Q&A tool there and get a question in the queue. We've got a few already, um, but there's still time to get yours in too. And yes, we do have a poll in front of you. So you should see in front of you this question, who within your organization cares about insider Insider threats. Now, we're not asking you who you think should care about them, but looking for sort of an honest, candid assessment since you're on this uh, event with us, you probably have some idea um, you care, um, but you uh, may know who it is who, who actually does or doesn't share your concerns about um, this problem and its nature and how many resources should be thrown at solving it. So, is it, um, and again, you can check all that apply. Obviously, security and IT teams would be one. Um, do you think it's um, uh, executive? Uh, concern? Do you think it's a board level concern? Uh, do you see HR really being engaged and aware of this problem? Um, do you think the employees themselves, your actual staff, is interested? And of course, we're giving you the option no one if you think nobody at all cares. So if you could please just, uh, we want to get a statistically significant uh, sample from the group. So if you could check out what, uh, whichever of these applies to your organization, um, then um, what we can do is uh, take a, just a quick look. And make sure you hit the submit button, by the way, too. We'll just take a quick look, and we'll see what the results are. And um, Joseph, I'm going to ask you to comment on these results first, if you can see them. Um, Obviously, security and IT teams are almost universally here um, concerned. Um, it's interesting to see these are just kind of going right down the line in, in the order that we asked. Um, is this what you were expecting to see in terms of a distribution from our attendees, Joseph? I think that lines up pretty well, actually, Lenny. I mean, here we are all on the phone as security professionals, right? So this is top mm -hmm. of mind for all of us as security professionals. And I know it, executives have been either – advised of this problem you know, by their, uh, their risk officers and their security teams and they're concerned about it. These types of things uh, end up in the news uh, too often for yep. executives not to, be, not to be worried about it and to have that as part of their overall focus on risk. So not, not too surprising. Yep. And um, Lauren, I'm going to ask you the same thing before you get started. What do you think of this distribution? Is it kind of in line with what you were expecting or – um, I agree. It's in line with what I would have expected, but I think something key um, here would be the fact that it needs to get to the point where we're really seeing it on everybody's radar. You know, yep. at some point, average employees, they really need to be fully aware of this and engaged, and that's what makes firms um, even more protected. Yeah, I would I would have to agree with that very much because if it's if they're not concerned, then there is almost this um, adversarial position where it's like something we're trying to do, and they're not. When obviously um, employees have a huge stake in the brand and health and, 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 and legal exposures of their own organization. Um, so I think it's interesting that this is a snapshot of reality, but obviously that reality has to change. And Lauren, I am really looking forward to your presentation, so I'm going to invite you to go ahead and get started. Great, thank you. Um, so just a quick note about Blackstone, um, in case folks aren't familiar with the company. Um, it's about a two to 3,000 person um, alternative asset management firm based in New York, um, invests in over 100 portfolio companies, 
And what's really nice about that is there's a community of the CISOs of all of these companies. Um, that community interacts regularly um, and has summits twice a year where we talk about things um, you know, like insider threat and other hot topics. So what's great with that community is, you know, not only am I thinking about leading my own insider threat program, but I have this whole other group of CISOs um, hearing about what they're doing um, to lead their own programs. Um, and before we dive a little deeper into operationalizing insider threat, I want a couple examples of just big cases that have either, you know, been in the news. Some of these are, you know, a little generic. Um, but just to show, you know, these all start with an employee. They all start with somebody that has access to a lot of sensitive information that they may or may not um, need to do their job. You know, a lot of companies at, at one point were giving really broad access, and only now are they starting to realize the repercussions of that and starting to minimize it and starting to have, you know, different checks. Um, and all of these types of attacks have very large impacts. Um, you know, I kind of listed here the, the initial impacts, but they all boil down to pretty significant either reputational, financial, regulatory um, issues that cut across the entire firm no matter what industry you're in. Um, but I think just because the financial sector is so heavily regulated and so heavily targeted, um, it, it tends to be front and center in a lot of the news stories. So next I'm going to walk through operationalizing an insider threat program. Um, and I'll mention I've come at this from two different angles. Um, at my former company, I launched the program from start. So we focused a lot on the things I'm going to discuss earlier. And then at my second company, I came into a program that was already started. They did that initial work. And then, you know, I jumped in and, and got more into the tool operationalization. Um, so basically, this, this is kind of a, a subset of what Joseph reviewed to you earlier about actually creating um, your insider threat program. So at this point, you're assuming you, know, you have that framework, you have a lot of the high-level processes, you have all that executive buy-in that you need, and you have the right people you know, ready to, to focus on insider threat. And in, in both cases, the way we really kicked off that operationalization portion was what are the different use cases? So what's really important to us? What do we want to make sure we're catching with this? Um, and then once we came up with that list, um, and the list was not just high level, you know, we want to look for data leakage, but it was really um, getting to know our infrastructure well. What are all the different logs we have? You know, what are we already feeding into our SIM? What are we not that maybe is a little too sensitive? Maybe things like, you know, employee um, annual performance ratings, um, you know, did their bonus go up or down? Very sensitive information that you wouldn't feed into a SIM. Um, you know, will we get the buy-in we need? Do we want to feed that kind of stuff in? And then what use cases are we going to do with that log set? Um, once we get that buy-in, once we're really all on one page between the folks involved in the insider threat program and that senior level of leadership, um, then we get to that external component. And there what we did, um, you know, looking at what are all the different vendors in this space? Um, and there's a lot of sub-components. I think the big component is the UBAs um, that, that Joseph went over. Um, there's user behavioral analytics. But within that, there's also some tools that do additional monitoring, um, some tools that do more of um, preventative controls. So there's really that whole gamut. Um, in both cases, we were really focused on UBAs. We really wanted to, to do something one step beyond what we were doing with all other facets of our information security pro, um, program. Uh, so next step, once we selected, you know, the, the vendor that we thought best fit our needs, best fit our use cases, and what log sources we had, um, then it comes time to approve a concept. Um, and, and depending on your organization, those can work in many different ways. Uh, a lot of vendors have the option to do one, you know, over the cloud, so you pick one or two data sources that you know are critical, that you really want to see how they work, send them there. Other ones, um, you know, can run on top of your existing SIM. Um, some of them can easily send from your existing SIM to it, do an internal deployment. Um, so all of those are the big questions, and, and many of them were really around log sources um, and then results of the analytics we wanted to run. Um, once that proof of concept is done, then you come to integration, um, and that's where I spent the bulk of my time at Blackstone. Um, and, and here, you know, the, the person that led the program before me, they did a great job. They did that proof of concept. They were like, this works. And we've seen it capture these types of activities. So for me, it was how do I tie that technical work into either existing operational processes throughout the firm or what new ones do we need to add? 
And what I mean by this is um, some programs or, or sorry, some companies already have a data leakage program. Maybe you know you're a commercial bank. So you're looking for um, credit card numbers or social security numbers or a lot of um, personal identifying information. Um, other companies, it, it's a little trickier where you can't just write an easy query to look for that data leakage. You have to take it a step further. Um, so for us, we were in that second category where we, we needed to write stuff that was a little more um, qualitative, a little less quantitative, and really look um, from a different light. So for us, it was how do we build this when there's no existing processes? So who needs to be involved? This is folks like compliance, human resources, legal. Um, who needs to be involved in every case? What are escalation procedures, right? You write all these great analytics, you get hits, what are you gonna do next? And like Joseph stressed, the most important thing is that you have repeatable, consistent processes, um, that everything you're doing, you're documenting it along the way, you're consistent, you're escalating the same types of cases to the same people. Every time you realize you need to do something a little differently, you're actually updating your entire workflow and making sure that you're doing it in that consistent manner for everybody, that you're not treating somebody different because maybe they're a little more senior or maybe you know that person, um, that you're just following these consistent rules. Um, along the way. So once we had that rough framework, you know, we put it together, Visio diagrams, a lot of text, a lot of meetings with those senior stakeholders. Then came time to onboarding the tool, onboarding the data feeds, um, and then writing the analytics on those. And I think this, you really need to come up with a phased approach, um, come up with what you want to target first, and then work along the way. You know, there's no reason to onboard all the data that you think you're going to need and then write the analytics. You know, come up with a plan, you know, one analytic at a, at a time, what data do you need, um, and what are you going to get the, the biggest benefit for? You know, what are those key use cases you've developed that you can really move forward? And then once you have the tool, it is working, you have those, um, those processes, procedures put into place, what do you do to train those analysts, to train the stakeholders, um, to make them aware that you have this new capability. Um, something I've noticed at both organizations is just making sure, you know, senior management, um, stakeholders throughout the organization know that you have these capabilities and when in a process to call you. You know, a big focus tends to be looking at levers. Well, if you notify the insider threat program after the person's already left the firm, it's a very different type of investigation than if you're doing it a couple months before the person leaves because you had advance notice. So things like that, just making sure the right folks, the stakeholders know when to involve you, what your capabilities are, and then the analysts, again, know what to look for and that they're doing it in a very consistent way. So for us, um, we decided we wanted to focus on four key areas that I listed here. Um, data leakage, and like I mentioned, a little different than the traditional data leakage. Um, here, it, it's a little more um, focused on the, the type of information in the documents, that high level, the what are the different pieces that put out, or, or sorry, that employees are sending out, and what data are you going to gather by putting those pieces together? So not necessarily client data, but um, but maybe something like um, you know a, a pre-release financial document or um, a statement about um, a merger or a company that we think you should invest in. Different things like that, which goes into the next two, which are insider trading and wall crossing. Um, and those are big things in the financial sector, um, especially with all the regulation. Just making sure that um, everything we should be able to detect on our own, we will be detecting. And this takes a very different set of logs than you would traditionally have in a SIM. And this is one of the values of a tool like Red Owl, where you can really combine these more like human readable, human type logs with a lot more of the, the traditional technical logs. Um, and then the last thing is high risk behaviors. And, and once we go to the next slide, I'll show you a pretty cool way where you can combine a bunch of analytics that actually look at the, the first three items I described and then combine other behaviors to really give you um, a full picture of different people that could potentially be your insider. Um, as an example, you know, when you're first starting out, these are a couple of the main data sources you're wa gonna wanna use. Um, Red Owl is actually the only tool that does a lot of this communication text-based analysis within the UBA tool. So here you're going to want to put email and chat, and you're going to get to read the full text, which gives you a little more flexibility 
than we're going to do with a traditional SIM where you're going to have more of um, your Active Directory, your proxy, your firewall, all of that technical data. This gives a little more color, a little more of that human perspective on the folks that you're looking at. And of course, it brings with it a lot more privacy concerns. Um, like Joseph mentioned, a lot of the folks that you're going to want looking at this, people with law enforcement, maybe intelligence community backgrounds, folks that are really used to segmenting this part of their life and not talking about anything they might read in this you know, extra data set that they're going to have access to that other folks aren't, that they're going to see sensitive data that really does not leave these cases, that does not get talked um, outside of those particular people in the insider threat program that need to know. Um, a lot of insider threat programs are going to have some cases where maybe you know, just legal needs to be involved in this one case or just employee relations, and they're going to have to have that depth and that knowledge to know really where to route things, um, especially if you get into having some of that personnel, um, employee relating, uh, employee relations type data or even, um, you know, annual performance ratings. Um, and then again, to the operational processes and that consistency. Um, some of the most important things are, you know, your analytics are going to yield certain things that you look at. And what are those thresholds? What is big enough for you to open a case versus not open a case? And really getting those hard lines. And what I found is you need to do a little bit of analysis. And then for your first month or two, you know, coming out of a POC, you're going to figure out where those thresholds are. What do you escalate? You know, and I found being a little more cautious is always better than, than not escalating things. Because as an analyst, you have, you know, one point of view, but the, those senior managers are going to escalate to are really going to fully understand that value of that data, especially when you're thinking on the data leakage front. Um, you know, they're going to know, well, this piece, um, it was already released to the public. You know, it was an SEC filing, so it doesn't matter that it's out. Versus, oh, well, no, that actually wasn't released until two weeks later. That's something big. That's something we need to handle. Um, and, you know, hand in hand with when to open and when you consider a clay, case closed, is also those escalation and delegation procedures. When do you involve the employee's manager? When do you just involve compliance and legal? When is it an employee relations manager? You know, and um, employee relations does that entire investigation. And all you hear back later is, you know, it's time to close that case. We took care of it. Um, you know, we understood there was an issue. It's resolved. Um, and then how do you integrate? You know, every information security program, you're going to have an incident response. You're going to have brand protection teams. Where are the lines between those processes and where are the handoffs? Because a lot of what we're finding, you know, we're initially going to think, well, this is an insider threat. But it may end up evolving. It may be an insider combined with an external um, or you, you end up with some stuff that just it'll really benefit from working closely with that incident response team. You know, maybe the attack is a little more technical and you're really going to need them um, for some of the more traditional, you know, content related stuff. So here, this is um, a, a screen of a high-level dashboard within Red Owl. And basically, what this one does is I mentioned those four categories. So let's say you write a bunch of individual analytics on those four different types. And each one you're going to give a certain priority. What this does is it takes all of your employees and all the different logs you've boiled in and ranks the people from you know 1 to 100 based on what kind of stuff you're going to see. Um, so when I think about data leakage, you know, it might be folks sending a lot of attachments to personal domains when they had never done that previously, or printing on nights and weekends, or coming into the office on the weekend when they never did before. So all of these different features, and each of them are going to use different log sources, all kind of boil up and give folks a risk score. So that's what you're going to see on that top left. Um, and then the graph on the top right, what that one is showing is let's say each one of those lines is a different component. So I just talked a little about data leakage. So one of those lines might represent data leakage. Another line might represent insider trading. Another one's going to represent just general suspicious, you know, behavior. Um, and there you can kind of see, all right, well, you, you click the person on the left. Where did they really seem suspicious? Was there a change? Was there a certain point where their behavior really, you know, skyrocketed in one area? And, you know, it was a little more normal um, in the other. So I find this quick glance, like, really helpful when I'm going to dive into a new case. Um, and then that other graph um, in the top right below it, there what you can see is a comparison between this one employee. How do they compare to their peers? So maybe there's somebody in compliance. How does their behavior look against other people in compliance? Or they're a vice president against other 
vice presidents throughout the firm, and then how do they compare against, you know, employees throughout the firm in general. Um, and then what you'll see, and I know it's really tiny um, at the bottom, is a little deeper dive into some of the other data that I find helps me with that, that first initial pass to give me a little understanding of the individual before I, I dive in. Um, and, and the center is attributes, you know, just, um, you know, their name, their department, their level, um, how long they've been at the firm, if they've already de uh, declared their intention to leave, or if they've even already left the firm. Um, on the left, what that tells you is what are the different analytics you've written that triggered, you know, so what were the key points, what was the interesting behavior for this person? And then on the right, um, who are the top entities this person is involved with? You know, maybe most of the people you look at, everyone they're involved with, it's other people in their department. And all of a sudden you come up with somebody and their main communication is with somebody at an external media agency. Um, this just gives you that initial point where you dive in. Um, for me, I've been very focused on data leakage recently, so I've been looking a lot at, I'm interested in who are you communicating with, what are your communication patterns, um, what are the key things that you're doing really like outside of the firm or outside of your department. Um, and I uh, just wanted to close with a, a couple of best practices that have helped me along the way in, in both organizations. Um, one of them is really just doing that initial analysis. It's going to take you a long time, but coming up with what are those different log sources, what are the analytics you want, what are the end results, because it's going to help you prioritize how you onboard every single analytics, the workflow, the end results, um, and, and the impact of your program. Most folks don't have insider threat programs, so you're going to be the first one creating it. And you really want to make sure that you have that structure and that all the senior folks that are supporting you know that you know what you're doing, that you're focused on the biggest risks first and then working your way down. Um, again, having that documented formal workflow, you know what you're going to do with everything you find, you know where you're going to pass it, um, and, and what you're going to do next. And then, um, you know, all this that I went into, it's great, but it should really be supplementing those preventative measures, um, you know, education and employee awareness, so folks know what social engineering is, um, they know about what all the different threats are, um, that, you know, if you're in a firm where you really don't want stuff sent out, that you have the proper blocks in place for email, for webmail, for USB, for any of those egress points, um, that all that should be done, and then monitoring should be rounding out that entire insider threat posture. So I will now pass um, back to Lenny for questions. Yes, you will. And that was completely awesome description of uh, what you've been doing and also of the Red Owl tool. Um, and we are, are going to have a, a few minutes for Q&A. Um, before we do that, I uh, have pushed out that feedback form. should be opening on your computer. Again, if your pop-up blocker has prevented the uh, form from launching, um, just click the red survey icon at the bottom of your screen and make sure you click Submit Answer because we want you to fill out the form and send it to us. Um, so thank you in advance for that. Um, okay, we've got lots of interesting questions here, so we'll try to get to them as, as quickly as we can. Uh, Lauren, I think I want to ask you first, because um, you mentioned this thing about when somebody leaves the company um, you know, versus uh, uh, sort of before and after, and you talked about processes. So is it one of the key issues there about termination is in fact sort of the process by which HR, which I guess owns termination connects with IT, which owns um, data and application access privileges, right? Does that tend to be sort of a problem in an organization is the process by which people get their privileges um, completely and fully revoked to all resources upon termination, like either automatically or the process? Can you just talk a little sure. bit about just that idea of how termination actually happens in a digital organization? Right, and there's actually two components. So first I'll answer that part, and then I'll kind of explain a little bit behind the comment I made earlier. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of firms have a set process for employee onboarding and employee mm -hmm. offboarding, and they have a set process for when an employee changes roles. Yep. Um, and all of those processes make sure that you really only have access to the resources you need. Um, a lot of places will have, you know, every quarter, your, your manager is going to verify, you know, do you still need access to these project shares or these tools and everything. Um, and the most important thing, like you said, is, you know, on an employee's last day, that evening, to make sure they lose all their access, 
-hmm. and you know that's your your key card for the building your login even access to individual tools just so you don't have an open account that somebody could use if they were to hack into your firm and use lateral movement you really just want to close every door that you can Mm -hmm. um, the reason I had made the comment earlier though was a slightly different point um, and there what I was getting at is if your concern with the individual is data leakage while the employee is an employee of the firm, you know, it's easy. You can call them into their manager's office. You can have a discussion. You can get a little more um, information. But once an employee leaves the firm, then um, it just gets to be a little bit more of a challenging situation um, with, you know, getting them to, to come back to the office or possibly, you know, going to their area of residence. Whereas when they're still here, you can just have those deeper um, conversations and really understand the situation a lot more. Yes, understood. And um, I think um, it, it would be also good to ask you a question because you did bring up something, you touched on something very briefly that I think is really interesting, which is this idea of um, the behavior as it's, of, of people as it's manifest in unstructured content, especially emails. So can you talk a little bit about how you operationalize that in terms of um, keyword searches and like at, at a firm like Blackstone, and I'm sure you can't get too much into specifics, but obviously the names of the companies that you're looking at and dealing with and the deals you're working on are always changing. So those keywords you're looking for might have to, uh, you know, your, 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 your detection of anomalous use of them is going to change as the business is doing different things. Um, is, 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 are we on the right track here in talking about that this is a way of detecting behavior? And again, there's so, somehow the, the security people have to interact with the business people to even know what to look for, um, you know, semantically in those emails. No? Yes? Exactly, and and so that's one of the challenges and why for UBAs, people doing um, things like um, insider trading analytics, why those tend to be more of like a last step in a program, okay. because then you really need that sensitive access. You need to know what companies we're doing deals with immediately when those companies get on the radar. Um, whereas what I was referring to earlier, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of keywords you can use to look for specific behaviors. Right. Um, so, for instance, there's sediment analysis. Maybe you mm -hmm. have a lexicon of words that indicate that someone is disgruntled with something. Yep. And maybe you pair that lexicon with a certain lexicon for a, a type of domain. Um, you know, maybe they're in HR, but they're using a lot of words that are typically used by investment bankers. Yep. And so it's really the that concept of lexicons and combining those lexicons that helps you get around when you can't really just like, you know, look for credit card numbers or, or things that are easily searchable in a quantitative way. So so what you're saying is that um, if an HR person is using the name of too many single malt scotches in their emails, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to impugn investment bankers at all. Um, so I want, to, I want to talk to Joseph for a second and ask you a couple of these questions um, because you also made reference to this idea of um, while we live in a world where people want access to a lot of information, we do have to um, govern that a little bit. How the heck do you do that? I mean, who tells who what somebody really needs access to? I feel like in an empowered digital workplace, um, a lot of times managers don't even know what their teams really need access to because they've told them to get a job done, right, as opposed to use these tools to do it. So can you talk to a little bit about sort of the tension between the democratization of data and even the logistics of like how you define um, or how you restrict data access to some kind of data that somebody might say, well, wait, you asked me to do this job and I think I can do it using this stuff. Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, where, where our manager may not, have, may, may not have that visibility, it's really looking at uh, who are the right people to have access to the things we really care about. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone does not need access to the cardholder data. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, many, of these, many of the cardholder data breaches have happened over time, it happened because somebody used live data in a uh, test environment. So why mm -hmm. on earth do we have a developer uh, accessing, you know, live cardholder data uh, that's in a in a production system? You know, so it's things like that, kind of understanding you know, where do we need to uh, limit uh, access based on role. And one of the ways we you know do that uh, at Forrester 
uh, when we're advising clients is with the zero trust framework. And what zero mm -hmm. trust means is uh, we don't necessarily look at everything that happens inside a corporate environment or a network uh, as, as a trusted environment, right? Because we, we want to create micro parameters or segmentation around mm -hmm. the data that we care about. And that's, you know, PCI data, PHI, PII, intellectual property. Uh, it could be M&A type activity, uh, as Lauren made reference to, those types of things. Uh, everyone doesn't need to have access to that. Let's just say I'm a, I work in the customer service organization. Is there any reason I should have any insight into what type of M&A activity my company is up to? Uh, no, I should absolutely not have access to that. So it's understanding mm -hmm. what the role of the individual is. And they, if they need access to do a job, let's give that access, and then once the job's done, take the access away. Mm. Um, and make sure that they didn't download the data uh, to a system that's not protected. Yeah, and we tend to be um – we tend to have better processes for, okay, somebody's asked for this, I can give it to them, than we do um, putting a time stamp on it or knowing when we have to check whether we revoke it, right? So a lot of things get turned on and never get turned off. Definitely. Yeah. Um, another question for you. You made reference to sort of geographies. You mentioned Europe in particular, where you have to respect privacy. We have a couple of questions in here, and I think, Lauren, I'm going to ask you to weigh on, in on this um, after Joseph, um, about, so can you really, like, read and monitor email? Are there regulatory issues about it? Never mind the sort of the big brother culture. Um, are there actually controls on that, and does that involve getting general counsel involved and or a compliance officer or somebody else? I'm not really sure where that question is going, right? But let's just – we'll take uh, Germany as our case example. Yep. Um, right? Uh, there is a, a perceived right to privacy in Germany, and that mm -hmm. means that if you're going to, you, you can't really monitor something without the employee's permission to monitor it. Uh, so who in their right mind is going to grant that permission? Um, and so yes, that is a general counsel type question. Uh, before I would embark on a threat hunting type um, uh, function mm -hmm. in an organization, and Lauren, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Yep. Um, I definitely believe that the general counsel should have visibility uh, to what the policies around the threat hunting program is and how what the protections are around that sensitive data. And, and before you answer, uh, Lauren, I just want to sort of uh, bring another question in this that, that we have here because you made reference to this idea of what do you want to put in the SIM, right? So it's not just reading emails. You talked about um, making a decision. So, so who – I mean, it seems to me there's a lot of potential stakeholders, not only general counsel, but HR and managers and anybody who's managing culture. Um, you, so if you want to talk about not only the legalities but also add the culture part of it of what it is you actually decide to put in or not put into. To um, you know, a tool like um, you know, let's put in a tool like Red Owl or your SIM or whatever. Exactly. Um, like both of you guys said, general counsel um, is involved every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and with financial institutions, you'll find too, it's um, the legal general counsel department, and it's also the compliance team. Mm -hmm. And so every decision, um, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, which ones it's okay to do, which ones it's not, which ones you can do certain things versus not. And again, that's where having like a handbook and having all the training and having that is so key to make sure your analysts and all your folks involved aren't encroaching on any of those privacy rules in certain regions. Um, and again, the same thing with the logs. You may be allowed to use some logs in some jurisdictions, and you can't touch those logs in others, and you just have to, to change your program, change your analytics, and just understand those limitations. Yep. Um, and we are near the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask you maybe each to give a quick final word before I wrap up. Uh, Lauren, we'll start with you briefly, and then Joseph, just any final thoughts? Sure. Um, for me, I just think the biggest thing to stress um, with operationalizing an insider threat program is really getting those key stakeholders involved and having them involved almost on a daily basis. And by key stakeholders, I mean legal, compliance, employee relations, maybe even physical security, and your information security team. Great point, Joseph. I have to reiterate uh, Lauren's point, honestly, uh, because this really is a top-down team exercise. It's not uh, to, to be taken only by a security team. Uh, you know, I talked with uh, other vendors who are not Red Owl, 
and uh, mm-hmm. you know, ask them, you know, hey, I'm looking at this alert. What would I do with this? And they would say, oh, well, if you're a security analyst, wouldn't you just call the employee's manager? I'm like, mm-hmm. that is the absolute wrong answer. Right? Yep. Every every single time, you've got to have good process, and you've got to involve uh, the right people in your organization uh, to operationalize those processes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank you guys. You did just a great job. I wish we had uh, more time, um, but I will let our attendees know that for more information related to um, today's webinar, just visit any of the resource links um, that you'll see in the green folder yeah, on your uh, on the screen there. Um, and that within the next 24 hours, you're going to receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. By the way, if we did not get to your question in Q&A, we've got it in the queue. We will um, contact you directly offline because uh, we don't want your question to go unanswered. And I guess with that, I will thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Build a Successful Insider Threat Team, brought to you by Dark Reading, Red Owl, and uh, UBM who broadcast it. And I do have to tell you, Speaking of compliance, that the webinar is copyright 2016 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Red Owl, and our individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions, including any opinions about wearing hoodies to work. So on behalf of, of Joseph and Lauren, I'm Lenny Lieben. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day.